for joining in everybody and thank you so much for your time dr shahat uh, you know for giving us time on a saturday Welcome. so everybody you know that there was um, recently there was a systemic umbrella review that was published which aimed at assessing the available evidence for and against the serotonin theory of repression. So today we have with us Dr. Mujib Shah, who is the adjunct professor of psychiatry at the University of Nevada and the adjunct professor of psychiatry at the Toro University and the residency program director at the Valley Health System Las Vegas. So he will be sharing our invalu is invaluable insight on the myths and the facts about the serotonin hypothesis. So before giving the mic to him, uh, if anybody has any questions, please put them in, in the Q&A box so we can answer them at the end of the session. Okay, over to you now, Dr. Shah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I think this was actually um, uh, planned because uh, there were some uh, students who were interested uh, in talking about the, the serotonin hypothesis because recently there was a big uh, media splash uh, when this article came out in molecular psychiatry and everybody uh, was kind of taken aback. Uh, and basically that was more in the general population and people who don't know about the mechanisms of action of, uh, of uh, psychotropic medications or any understanding into the neurobiology of and pathophysiology of depression, which actually got concerned. So I think it's a good time to at least uh, calm down the anxieties uh, and concerns in uh, budding psychiatrists who are interested in becoming psychiatrists and uh, may actually, you know, may be deterred by this, uh, by this uh, uh, kind of wrong uh, uh, mediation of knowledge uh, as, as was reported in that uh, review paper. So let's begin. So even before we move, move further, I think it's very important to talk about what is serotonin so that people understand that what is the role of serotonin in a uh, human body, including periphery as well as the central nervous system. So actually serotonin is a monoamine, as we all know. Uh, it is not a catecholamine, as some people might uh, believe. It is actually an indolamine, uh, which is uh, a different chemical structure and a different uh, amino acid basis, right? So actually it is uh, uh, made in the brain uh, for uh, use in the central, uh, in, in the brain itself. Uh, and it is actually made from tryptophan through the uh, enzyme, which is called tryptoph uh, 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 tryptophan hydroxylase. And um, there is another very important serotonin system, which actually exists in the periphery. Uh, and uh, since serotonin cannot cross blood brain barrier, actually these two systems have distinct functions because they are not, uh, uh, as serotonin cannot cross the blood brain barrier. So from the serotonin from the central nervous system cannot, uh, uh, obviously cannot go into the periphery and the peripheral cannot come into the brain. So that's an important concept to have. Uh, there are distinct functions uh, distributed to both these uh, uh, serotonin compartments. Um, the peripheral compartment is basically involved with the, uh, with the, some uh, maintaining the physi uh, physiological homeostasis and plays a very significant role in the uh, in the glucose uh, homeostasis and uh, uh, homeostasis and metabolic uh, uh, homeostasis so we are not going to discuss in detail about those things but but we are only going to be exclusive about the central uh, serotonin activity in the brain so here you can see some of the peripheral effects on the right side. I've illustrated in that diagram. Um, so it is kind of a surprise. Uh, I knew, I came to know about this uh, 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 few uh, couple of decades back, but it seems like that a lot of people actually don't perceive that only 5% of serotonin is, uh, is in, uh, in the central nervous system. And 95% of serotonin is actually found in the GI or the gastrointestinal cells. So it's only a, a minority of serotonin uh, uh, presence in the brain, 
uh, which actually is import, uh, uh, relevant to so many different important brain functions as we will see. Okay, so what are the functions of serotonin? Uh, we talked about a little bit, you know, earlier, but in the brain, basically, if you want to remember, uh, it is actually called a, a, a kind of a relaxing or happy chemical in the brain because it, it makes you calm and, and, and relax. Um, and if you are have a normal functioning of serotonergic systems in the brain, you feel emotionally stable, happier, uh, anxiety-free, and calmer. Um, and low levels have been, as, as you would know, have been associated with depression, anxiety, and so many different other conditions which uh, uh, we are going to discuss uh, here in this slide. Uh, it is also uh, important in learning and memory. Uh, uh, decades back, there were studies in which uh, serotonin was studied in lower uh, forms of life and uh, like, for example, there was some snail aplysia studies, I remember from, uh, from old times, that serotonin was believed to be the neurotransmitter of pain uh, and, and learning through pain and all that. So that's old news, but, but it is uh, in, in, in uh, human beings, it also plays uh, a role in learning and memory. Appetite, everybody would know that because SSRIs have been known to make uh, appetite changes. Um, Short-term basis, SSRIs can cause weight loss, but in long-term basis, uh, 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 SSRIs can cause weight gain, as we have seen in uh, multiple studies, uh, preclinical trials, and post-marketing surveillance studies. Right. Uh, so in the GIT, you are not going to uh, uh, discuss a lot, but uh, in GIT, serotonin is is very important. Uh, uh, you know, one of the mechanism you would write rightly understand and immediately understand is that this nausea, vomiting, diarrhea uh, are mediated by excessive uh, serotonin in the GI tract. Uh, uh, not the only mechanism, but one of the important mechanisms uh, peripherally uh, in the periphery. But uh, the, the whole goal is to protect the uh, uh, GI tract from toxins and uh, you know uh, uh, the foods that have gone bad and and things which don't don't agree with our body so that's a kind of a defense mechanism that you develop nausea and vomiting uh, which is uh, mediated uh, uh, among many things uh, also with uh, serotonin um it also plays a role in appetite um as as uh, you know has been uh, seen so many times that uh, there is some type of serotonin receptors which actually get blocked, they can cause weight gain. So I'm not going to put all of that at this time. And, there, and then there are other uh, uh, functions, sleep, bone health. You know, uh, some of you might know that um, increase in serotonin activity can result in osteoporosis. Uh, so, so we need to be careful and mindful uh, of that effect. Uh, this is very important uh, in older uh, patients because uh, they already uh, suffer from uh, physiological osteoporosis. Uh, uh, their bones become uh, uh, thinner as compared to the younger patients, as we all know, uh, especially those uh, uh, elderly patients who actually also develop uh, increase in prolactin levels because of maybe somebody is using antipsychotic medications in those patients. And, and uh, having SSRIs plus antipsychotic medications can actually increase the risk for osteoporosis. So, so the, we, this should be clinically kept in mind when you are treating older patients especially. Sexual health, we all know SSRIs are well known to cause sexual dysfunction, primarily via 5-HT2A receptor going down the spinal cord. Uh, and and that, that, is one of the, that is one of the primary mechanism. Temperature regulation, how many times I've heard from patients that uh, you know, since they have started SSRIs, they actually are sweating more, especially uh, it is more commonly, I think, in my experience, have been uh, uh, seen with the SNRI as compared to only SSRIs, but, but it has been reported. Uh, pain, uh, we just discussed that. Um, so there have been multiple depression hypotheses. Uh, and you should be familiar with these because they may mean differently. Serotonin hypothesis actually is the one we are discussing today, which we are going to elaborate further. But it primarily means that uh, diminished activity of serotonin 
in the serotonin pathways in the brain actually uh, play a causal role in the pathophysiology of depression. So I would have some problem with the causal role. Um, um, uh, so we'll discuss that a little bit more in detail, okay? Catecholamine hypothesis actually involves uh, dopamine and norepinephrine, especially norepinephrine, uh, which is a catecholamine, right? So, so one can understand that. Monoamine hypothesis actually um, also involved, uh, actually it's a more comprehensive hypothesis because it involves all three major neurotransmitter systems which we have known to be playing a putative role in the mediation of depression. So that is serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And there is another uh, hypothesis which is not as popular, which actually is called monoamine deficiency hypothesis. And this actually is the one in which you know, monoamine oxidase inhibitors were actually used this principle where they actually block the monoamine oxidase enzyme and, uh, and uh, actually increase the levels of, uh, uh, of all three major neurotransmitter systems as we discussed above. So if there is a deficiency, uh, a monoamine deficiency, which could be actually um, uh, due to uh, uh, monoamine oxidase increased activity, activity, for example, or there may be some genetic variances. So, so that is one which is not as popular as the others. Now, the challenge to the monoamine, I'm sorry, serotonin hypothesis has not been new. There are multiple reports as published in this paper in 2005. I'm not going to go over all of this, but just to tell you that all these are statements from uh, researchers documented in this paper who actually don't uh, uh, had some problems with the, or major problems with the serotonin hypothesis. So the support for serotonin hypothesis actually comes from uh, multiple aspects. One is that SSRIs uh, uh, have uh, uh, become the first line of treatment for uh, management of depression. We all know that. And uh, even if you look at the, the uh, uh, results from the STARDI trial, which was the biggest effectiveness trial in uh, actually the world history, uh, not only just in America, very expensive uh, multi-million uh, uh, project. And in that actually, uh, uh, although we uh, observed only 30, uh, uh, about uh, one out of three uh, uh, getting remitted from depression, uh, with antidepressant treatment, uh, after four stages were complete of the, the 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 whole study had actually four stages of, you know, if uh, if some patients don't respond to the first step, then they go to the next and the third and the fourth. Uh, so um, although I'm highly skeptical uh, of the remission rates, we need to improve our treatments. But at the same time, at the end of the four stages or steps, actually sixty percent patients were uh, uh, remitters. Uh, which actually tells you that, and it is not just SSRIs. So I, I should clarify that all other different types of antidepressants were included in that. But uh, but the starting uh, dose uh, uh, medication antidepressant was citalopram. So so that is remains a fact. Anyway, so so there is uh, there is this uh, significant evidence uh, that antidepressants do work. Um, uh, actually, and that is one of the major criticism that a um, lot of people uh, actually, you know, um, believe that by challenging serotonin hypothesis, they can all, uh, they can also throw out the efficacy of SSRIs in the, in the management of depression, which is completely uh, uh, wrong, you know. So, so the audience should understand that, that you cannot separate serotonin hypothesis or any other monoamine uh, hypothesis uh, from uh, the medications which are developed on these models and are effective antidepressants. So that is one major point. <clears throat> so that is the evidence. Um, the evidence is also, uh, some evidence comes from uh, the studies which were uh, actually relatively older studies now. I've not seen any new studies on this. Uh, the, the patients, uh, uh, healthy controls and patient as well, were uh, depleted in their tryptophan intake. Since tryptophan is the essential amino acid, it has to be ingested to make serotonin. Uh, and so the idea behind this, <clears throat> these studies were that if you deplete the diet from tryptophan, you can actually induce depression uh, or depressive symptoms or mood symptoms 
not only in depressed patients, but also in the healthy controls. Uh, and it didn't turn out we are going to re-examine this uh, in other slides. Uh, so let's continue. So, uh, you know, it is very simplistic uh, to just label a single neurotransmitter system, in this case, uh, uh, serotonin, uh, uh, because brain disorders are, are the most complex illnesses of the whole human body, you know. And brain is the most complex organ in the whole universe, uh, as, as far as we know, unless there are some alien species which uh, uh, much uh, better cognitive abilities than human beings. Uh, but but uh, so it remains that brain is the most complex uh, system and uh, hundreds of uh, uh, and, and millions and billions of interactions are occurring uh, in the chemicals, uh, uh, brain lying in a chemical soup and interactions are, uh, occurring there. It is very simplistic that uh, we can just blame serotonin uh, for mediating all uh, uh, different cases of uh, depressive disorder. Uh, it is very open to criticism, as you can see. Um, um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, what, what we have seen is that one of the major criticism, which actually is raised by the, by the other group, is that um, if uh, why uh, patients don't respond, uh, a larger number of patients respond to a certain mechanism of action, in this case, SSRIs, and why, uh, you know, uh, uh, they respond to some other antidepressants and some other modalities. So that question is, is, is very pertinent and we are going to discuss that. Um, and then, uh, you know, I talked about the study finding, which is approximately 33% actually of the depressed patients actually met with the first SSRI, as, as I told you with the study study. Now, this is again the same thing. I don't want to repeat this, but, but because of this limitation uh, that we have now realized that one neurotransmitter system is not going to be uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the beginning or the end of it all. And there are other systems. And that is why, you know, now we are seeing uh, a paradigm shift from monoamine hypothesis or serotonin hypothesis to newer, uh, uh, more fertile grounds where we are actually developing more effective uh, and, 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 and perhaps more tolerable antidepressants. Now, this is an analogy. I was just thinking this morning, I added these slides just very late this morning. And I was thinking, how can I give a kind of a, a analogy on medical illnesses, which actually will make the students and the residents understand what are, you know, what are the problems with the mono hypothesis or a mono neurotransmitter hypothesis uh, explaining all cases of depression. So when you look at the different causes of type 1 diabetes, you see, there are so many different cause, uh, uh, causes of diabetes. Now, if somebody develops a surrogate marker, like say if somebody can, you know, uh, has never been done, but somebody starts to measure insulin uh, uh, kind of levels uh, in human bodies and, and try to find link between, uh, you know, all cases of diabetes actually are, are kind of related to a certain level of insulin, uh, uh, you know, a, a, just a hypothesis, right? It's never going to pan out because there are so many different types and they may have different implications. Even if you compare between type 1 diabetes and type 2, you're not going to see consistency across the board because there will be different uh, insulin uh, function involved. What about uh, insulin uh, uh, resistant uh, diabetes uh, in which you are going to see maybe probably a completely different picture? that there will be increased level of insulin, but even then patient will have diabetes. So I just wanted to kind of give you an idea that although diabetes is a medical illness at much less complex illness than, than major depressive disorder involving a much more complex system, um, a highly complex system, you know, even with diabetes, we cannot be sure that we are going to develop exact and specific markers uh, uh, which can indirectly tell you that which type of diabetes and what kind of treatments and, and what kind of uh, strategies would be more helpful. Similar is the case with hypertension. Now, before we advance, I think how much time, I think the time is flying. Um, so I am going to um, uh, actually uh, skip this slide because of this time issue. 
And now there are some, uh, you know, you will say, I'm not talking about the paper. So let's come to the paper now. Now this was the paper, right? And this paper actually uh, 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 created this, uh, this media uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, concern that, uh, oh my God, uh, we have been using SSRIs and now uh, there is uh, this group uh, actually has published the data that there's no evidence to support uh, serotonin uh, hypothesis. And, and so uh, the, uh, I told you the premise of this, right? So actually, you know, when you look at one of the statement from, from the, uh, you know, from this paper, it actually, and I quote, we conclude that it is possible, impossible to say that taking SSRI antidepressant is worthwhile or even completely safe. They're right. That I have a huge problem with that, you know, because they talk about uh, the surrogate markers for serotonin. They show that the surrogate markers are not uh, uh, correlated with the uh, with the depressive uh, symptom neurobiologically, and then talk about SSRI. And the primary author, you should all know this. This is a a kind of a biased kind of a paper in some ways, because the primary author. Uh, has previously authored multiple peer-reviewed articles which were highly critical of drug-based approach to treating mental health. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, you know, Church of Scientology kind of a guy, uh, seems to me. But the most surprising thing, I was very disappointed that uh, a status of molecular psychiatry, which is one of the best impact factor journal in psychiatry, actually allowed this paper to get published. So basically, I just told you a little bit about this, that, um, you know, the study actually reported, uh, although it is a fact, that actually they looked at the 50 years work on this topic and reported some of those studies and meta-analysis and reviews. Uh, but, you know, you have to really remember that all these, uh, all the reviewed studies actually used indirect measure of serotonin function. Uh, um, and even uh, uh, even worse than that, they actually looked at merely the proxies for serotonin activity, such as the gene linkage studies, which uh, we will discuss a little bit uh, uh, in in, in uh, uh, later slides. Um, we have actually recently developed our insights into the technology where we can measure serotonin release in the living human brain in vivo. And in one of these studies, actually, which is uh, quite uh, uh, relatively recent, actually, they showed that uh, decreased serotonin release was found in people with depression. So this is this is uh, the evidence from uh, one of the studies in the first such study after looking at the serotonin release. Now, you know, we let me see if I'm in the correct slide. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so we all, the question is not that uh, there's no evidence for serotonin hypothesis. There is, the article has been biased and I'll show you why, because they didn't report some of the studies which support serotonin hypothesis, right? Uh, and uh, this meta-analysis actually, which actually uh, uh, was published in 2021, which is a cutoff, unfortunately, because this uh, review only included studies until December 2020. 2020 December. So this was this published this meta analysis was published in 2021 uh, could not be included, and actually it reported and the author stated concluded that our integrated results revealed that metabolic changes in the peripheral blood were associated with major depressive disorder, particularly decreased tryptophan, which is the one we were discussing earlier. This is actually. You know, I was really pleased with this because I, I this is gives you another angle that taking acetaminophen can be helpful for headaches, but no one believes that headaches are caused by not enough acetaminophen, uh, acetaminophen in the brain. Acetaminophen is, I think, available in Pakistan as Panadol and here as Tylenol. Now, these are these are the actual methodology of the paper, which I'm going to bring some points to you. So basically, they actually uh, did not specifically define their eligibility, cri eligibility criteria. 
they actually included uh, some studies. They focused on large studies and they focused only the recent studies. Uh, there have been landmark studies in the past uh, with uh, quite significant serotonin uh, hypothesis finding and they excluded them. So that is one bias I, I came across uh, in, this, in this review paper. And then they actually uh, stated somewhere in the paper that they, uh, they rule out some studies with the overlapping uh, meta-analysis with overlapping studies. But later on, I saw that they included studies in which there was some overlap. So that is another discrepancy I came across. Uh, they only included uh, studies until December 2020 uh, when the paper was published in 2022. Uh, so although I think it takes a long time for papers to get published, uh, but, but it is, uh, you know, uh, when I do write reviews and when I do meta-analysis, I actually write to incorporate the studies like yesterday, if I can. Uh, anyway, so um, they actually um, um, included large um, uh, studies. Uh, although, uh, you know, this is very interesting. Uh, I will read this for you. Um, we actually aimed on the left side uh, uh, the, the, uh, of the slide, you will see in the second yellow uh, highlighted part. We aim to identify the best evidence available. Therefore, we also included some large studies that combine data from individual studies, but did not employ, remember, did not employ conventional systematic review methods. So I don't have to say any further about that. Now these were, so you see the, in the central part of this slide, there is a highlighted uh, long paragraph um, or sentences. Actually, this is the basis of their, uh, these were the markers they were looking at, the surrogate markers, as we discussed earlier. So I have, for clarity, they are here. So first one was they looked at the serotonin, the studies in relation to serotonin and serotonin metabolite 5-HIAA, which is 5-hydroxyindole five, five acetic acid, acid, sorry, which is a metabolite of, of, uh, 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 of uh, serotonin. So they wanted to look at that and they said that uh, they wanted to question whether there were lower levels of serotonin and 5-HIAA in body fluids in depression. The second one was receptors. They looked at the serotonin receptors and wanted to see if alteration in these receptors actually was consistent with the serotonin hypothesis. And then they looked at the serotonin transporter. They looked at the depletion studies Remember, we talked about, about the tryptophan depletion studies. They looked at the uh, uh, serotonin transporter gene, not just the transporter, but also the gene. Uh, um, and, and they also looked at the, you know, there is some, uh, there are some controversial data out there now, which actually uh, uh, has uh, investigated the inter interaction between the uh, transporter gene and stress in depression. So this was the first one. Um, so basically, you know, when I reviewed this, uh, the authors acknowledged that there were large scale studies that were missing uh, because it's an invasive uh, process. You have to measure the 5-HIAA in CSF. Uh, and, and so uh, large numbers, uh, large sample studies were missing. And uh, one, meta, uh, one meta analysis uh, of three observational studies. So these were just observational studies, okay? In postmenopausal women, actually revealed uh, significant changes in 5-HIAA uh, between depressed and non-depressed. Uh, however, uh, did not reach significance when uh, the covariates were controlled for. So this was uh, the, the, uh, the one meta-analysis they reviewed. Uh, and two meta-analyses of 19 studies, out of which seven studies were overlapping. As I stated earlier, they overlap, they include in meta-analysis with overlapping studies, did not show any difference. And um, the, there were no reports of significant evidence of low 5-HIA levels in patients with suicidality and violent uh, suicidal attempts. Uh, they actually did not uh, report those. So it was completely missing. I'm sorry, this was completely missing from uh, their review that they didn't even bother to, uh, to report the studies. Uh, there are multiple studies 
which have shown that there have been low 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid levels in patients who attempted suicide, especially those who were males and who had violent uh, uh, suicide comple uh, completions. So this was a big neglect in this paper. I have some data for you very quickly because we're running out of time. Um, just, just wanted to show you, just you have to believe me or you can go and note the references and read yourself. Uh, uh, so in these two studies, uh, lower 5-HIA levels predicted uh, uh, actually, what actually what the risk factors uh, after attempted suicide in the patients who actually survived suicides, and also they found that in successful suicides there were especially those violent in males low five HIAA levels. Another uh, thing which actually uh, looked at the um, uh, link between five HIAA. Uh, and also the assessment of hopelessness using two scales. Actually, they found that the lower 5-HIAA levels were better predictors of completed suicides than hopelessness scales, okay? So just briefly. In schizophrenia, they didn't find any correlation between suicides and 5-HIAA levels, which makes sense because there may be different neurobiological underpinnings of depression in schizophrenia. Number two was receptors. So this is, I'm going to go quickly because we're running out of time. Um, so receptors, uh, one of the receptors which is really very important in terms of uh, mediating the uh, uh, the antidepressant effects of SSRI, and it is called 5-HT1A, which is 5-hydroxytryptamine-1A uh, subtype receptors. So 5-HT1A, uh, I, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction. 5-HT1A is a receptor which is a presynaptic receptor, and it is an auto uh, receptor, which means that, um, that, that when there is excessive uh, serotonergic activity uh, after excessive release from the presynaptic neuron, these presynaptic uh, serotonin receptors, that is what 5-HT1A, actually become stimulated and they put a break on the release of serotonin from the presynaptic neuron. So this is kind of a negative feedback loop system where there is a control over excessive and sometimes uh, even toxic release of serotonin from the presynaptic uh, neuron. So it's a protective mechanism. So basically what happens is when you give SSRIs and when SSRIs block the reuptake pump, and increase the activity of uh, serotonin in the synaptic cleft on the postsynaptic receptors, the presynaptic receptor is also activated, in this case, 5-HT1A. And it puts, puts break on the excessive release of serotonin from the presynaptic neuron because SSRIs are already causing too much increase in serotonin in the synaptic cleft. So in, that is one of the reasons why researchers actually believe that there is a long time in the mediation of antidepressant effect in four to six weeks, because the 5-HT1A receptors have to be have to be downregulated or desensitized uh, uh, for to allow more release of uh, serotonin from the presynaptic neuron, and that takes time because all these are genomic uh, uh, procedures and they take long time for the genes to to work. Uh, uh, it takes days and weeks, right? So that is a basic concept of 5-HT1A. The author said that if it is true that serotonin is involved in the mediation of depression, then the 5-HT1A receptors should be increased in number. Makes sense, right? Because if there is increased 5-HT1A receptor, then there will be release, decreased release of serotonin from the presynaptic neuron. And that makes perfect sense. But when you look at the studies, for example, this study, which was done, uh, PET scan studies, uh, I don't have much time to explain PET scan, but it is primarily one of the neuroimaging technique, which is used to assess uh, the occupancy of transporter proteins and receptors uh, by using radio ligands, such as in this case, this uh, way 100635 was used, which binds with the, uh, with the, um, uh, with the 5-HT1A receptor. It's a specific binder because if it's non-specific, then the study cannot work, right? 
So, so they did this uh, uh, positron emission tomography study, PET study, and they found that, uh, that there was a substantial uh, uh, decrease in 5-HT1 receptors in cortical areas in the recovered depressed subjects. What does that tell you? That initially the receptors were high in depressed patients and through the treatment of uh, antidepressant, they reduced. So I'm not going to spend any more time, but I'm just showing you the evidence. Number three was the serotonin transporter. Uh, and serotonin transporter, I already told you what it is. It is sitting in the perisynaptic neuron and it is one of the transporter proteins which actually uh, 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 reuptakes uh, 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 the serotonin uh, uh, for in the synaptic cleft so that it can be recycled and new serotonin can be made. This is very important and very complex. So please try to understand uh, uh, this because I think I would have a little bit of time for questions, but we can maybe extend the time if there is an interest in asking question. So it depends upon the moderator uh, and availability of time. But serotonin um, uh, uh, transporter blockade by the SSRIs is, has different consequences in different brain regions. Very important to remember and understand. For example, the serotonin cell bodies are lying in the Rafe nucleus, right? You know, uh, if you have studied your uh, neurophysiology uh, and neurobiology, you will know that, that the, the serotonin cell bodies are lying in the Rafe, where the uh, presynaptic uh, receptors are, are present, right? And these, uh, these actually then extend the tracts, serotonergic tracts throughout the brain. So that is a fact. So what happens here, that in since presynaptic receptors are lying in the Rafe nucleus, what will be the impact of SSRIs? SSRIs are going to actually decrease serotonin release in Rafe initially, right? We are talking acute changes. But what would happen in the uh, uh, in the other areas of the brain where serotonin uh, transporter is blocked, it will increase because there is a relative lack of autoreceptors in the higher cortical centers and the amygdala. So very important concept. Now, if this is such a complex situation, how can you use all these surrogate markers to challenge serotonin hypothesis? Despite the fact that it is not the beginning or the end of the all, uh, everything, as I told you earlier. A very important concept. Depletion of tryptophan. I'll just show you, rather than going into uh, uh, extensive uh, details, I will show you that, um, that there is uh, this paper published in, uh, uh, I think it was 2021, recent. It says that metabolic changes in the peripheral blood were associated with major depressive disorder, particularly, particularly decreased tryptophan. I, I think quoted that earlier too. And there are other evidence uh, available as well, which actually showed that tryptophan depletion uh, uh, has uh, some implications in depression. I'll just tell you one highlight of this. So for example, in the studies, what they found is that if they give tryptophan depleted diet in depressed patients who were untreated, there was no difference. But when tryptophan depletion diet was given in depressed patients who were treated, there was a significant relapse in depressive symptoms. Important point to remember. And then the uh, serotonin transporter gene, just a couple of points. Um, Serotonin transporter gene actually has obviously two alleles. Um, uh, so it can be a homozygous, uh, homozygous for short arm SS alleles, or it can be homozygous for L long arm uh, alleles, which is LL. So it can be a combination of heterozygosity. For example, S can be combined with L uh, 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 and so forth. Okay. So these are the different genotypes of the serotonin. What does it, this, uh, 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 what is the implication of this? Uh, very interesting. So when you see that there is, uh, uh, like for example, uh, let me see, this study was in adolescence. Yeah, this study was, was in uh, adolescence. 
So what they reported is that if there is a combination of a S and L allele, the adolescents who are depressed actually recover or decrease their depressive symptoms over time as compared to those who had L allele or L, uh, L genotype or homozygosity for the L uh, 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 type, okay? So basically, you know, that raises the question. It probably does not mean anything to you because I have to explain what the short and the long allele do. So the short alleles are a little bit deficient in uptaking the serotonin from the synaptic cleft. And L allele is the wild type or the normal type. So it makes perfect sense in adolescents who had actually a combination of a defective, rather defective allele in combination even with the normal allele, they actually had a little bit of kind of cushion where L allele was releasing enough, I'm sorry, uh, uh, was efficient enough to take, a, take up some of the serotonin to recycle it and, and, and um, uh, reprocess it and release it again. As compared to LL, uh, which actually in as a paradoxical way caused relatively relative deficiency of serotonin in the synaptic cleft uh, to, to, uh, to not allow uh, recovery over time in adolescents. So this is a complex issue. I'm, you know, ask me question if, if, if it is not clear, but that's basically what this study showed. And then the BD, BDNF and other issues, I don't have time. So if there are any questions, please, uh, please do, because I'm sorry for the long presentation, but there's so much to cover, right? Madhur, any questions? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shah, for a very comprehensive presentation. We do have two questions right now. Okay. Uh, so. Yes, uh, there's one question which says there are, so the, both the same questions, they're asking for ECT role in depression. Okay, um, ECT um, is, is something which uh, actually has been uh, kind of, you know, should I use the word bad mouth in uh, all over the world, uh, including developed countries such as America. Uh, Especially on the West Coast, you know, I struggle to get my patients uh, ECG treatments. And the reason I'm giving you this background is because in my belief, and I'm sure I think Dr. Ashraf is also attending this, he can maybe uh, share some thoughts on this. And I don't know whether Dr. Navid is, is also with us because initially he joined. So he can some, uh, say some comments because um, uh, on ECD. ECT is lifesaver. ECT uh, got bad name when there was a movie, One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest, uh, which was actually picturized at the hospital where I used to work in Salem, Oregon, uh, Oregon State Hospital. Uh, and I've seen the museum over there. Which they have all the historical facts about how patients used to be treat, uh, treated in the old times. Uh, horrible. Uh, uh, and so the ECD got bad name from that movie. And till this day, the public perception has not been changed on that. Whose fault is that? Probably it's my fault. Probably it's all our fault. Probably it's the fault of the uh, families of the mentally ill. Probably it's the fault of APA. Probably it's fault of all academia, right? Because we don't fight this battle. I, I really become disgusted with this, that ECT is deprived of the quality treatment of patients who don't have another any other option to survive. And the reason why ECT got bad name is because one flew over the cuckoo's nest, it was done without anesthesia. And the patient used to actually break bones. It has been reported because of the seizures, motor activity, right? But now it is done under anesthesia. And I bet with you, if you have seen any ECT these days, you only see one of the big toes moving. That's all. Actually, as a matter of fact, you know, I really believe it is safer than medications. So 
I can talk more again, like for hours on this, but uh, that's it. That's that's how I believe about it. Uh, uh, so this Dr. Ashraf, so th thank you, Dr. Shad, first of all, it was a uh, very good uh, presentation and, and you thank answered you. that. Uh, question and the controversy about the Suetonian hypothesis. So in regards to ECT, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Shad. Um, everyone remembers that image of the movie and, and definitely if you shock someone without the anesthesia and, and it's a central as well as the peripheral anesthesia, you have to give it to them uh, to relax the body and then you shock them. So when I was in training, we used to do it regularly every week on Friday mornings we would have about at least six to seven patients. We'll have two hours and it's pretty quick. Um, um, after the initiation, you know the uh, threshold and then there were lots of patients getting maintenance ECD and uh, they would come, get their treatment, go to the recovery room and after 45 minutes, they are fine, 45 minutes to an hour and then um, they'll leave from there. Um, the only issue that we saw in this day and age with that treatment was the memory loss around the time of ECT treatment. So when they are getting treatment, there is some memory loss, but that improved with the, after the treatments were done, after the continuation treatment was done. So that's the only thing that I could uh, see. Again, of course, there's a fear of getting the general anesthetic. So you have to explain it to them, um, uh, to the patients. Uh, but, but I think uh, the huge stigma comes from that image of, um, from that movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and is still, uh, is in the society. Very powerful treatment, even though we have had RTMS, we've had um, ketamine, other treatments uh, for depression, uh, but it's still, um, as Dr. Shad said, ECT has its place. Uh, with catatonia, that's the one you're gonna use to break it uh, pretty quickly. People who are pregnant and they don't wanna take medication for the right reasons, they don't wanna expose their kids and their family is not okay with it. Maybe that's becomes the number one choice for them. So there has to be a provision of ECD, not just for treatment resistant depression, but for these other indications when we are dealing with the uh, patients on the acute inpatient unit too. Thank you. Any other questions, Manu? Thank you so, uh, so much, Dr. Ashraf. No, we don't have any other question from the participants. I do have one question. Rodesha, uh -huh. that could not get the uh so the el allele uh, you were explaining so yeah, if yeah. you could, if you could yeah, please yeah. explain it again because it was like a little confusing yeah yeah it is confusing so didn't have time actually i again apologize because somehow i thought my talk is ending at 11 but actually it lasts until 11 15 so maybe i can uh, go back to the slides a little bit and explain what you are asking on okay uh, or or we, we can um i I can elaborate a little bit more because I think I have time. Yeah. Um, so, so serotonin uh, 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 transporter gene uh, is uh, uh, has uh, the genotype uh, the uh, two alleles, right? S allele and L allele. So the S allele is also called short, and L allele also called the long, right? Uh, so there can be homozygosity for each one of these. And there can be heterozygosity where one is combined uh, from each one, right? So far, so far, understandable. Okay. Yeah. So the S allele, uh, when there is homozygosity for S allele, the pump is deficient. So those patients actually don't respond that well to SSRIs. Why? Because the pump is doing working like an SSRI. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. And and as in contrast, the long allele homozygosity will be a very efficient reuptake of serotonin into the pyrosinatric neuron. Therefore, if there is relative deficiency of serotonin in the cleft, SSRIs will be very effective because the reuptake mechanism is so efficient that it is depriving the postsynaptic. Of course, the story is not that simple. There are so many other factors which have to come into play to cause depression, as we were just discussing earlier. But just a simplistic view I'm giving you, okay? So, so now you understand what is the function of S and L, right? So the study which was done in adolescent actually reported that the presence of S allele actually showed that adolescents 
over time actually reported reduced or lower symptoms of depression. Why is that the case? Because presence of S allele increases the availability of serotonin in the cleft. Now you understand that? Yes. Okay. So that actually, actually that that supports uh, supports uh, uh, serotonin uh, hypothesis in a way. Um, but you know what? Um, let me just rephrase. Uh, you know what? Because we have a little bit of time. Um, serotonin hypothesis. Uh, I didn't. I didn't comment on some of the interesting issues. When you look at the paper. They actually talk, they don't talk about serotonin hypothesis. They talk about serotonin theory. Do you know what is the problem with that? What is the difference between hypothesis and theory? I think so, nobody, very few people were able to capture this. Yeah, what is the difference? We all have the notion that hypothesis and theory is almost the same thing. Like there's no actual scientific evidence to be proven about it but theory like you then. know what about theory yeah that's what i'm saying like i think for me hypothesis and theory uh what i know is like they're almost the same thing no they're not the same so google it you'll find the differences theory is a much higher level where something has been supported or confirmed by the evidence hypothesis is not proven until the null hypothesis is rejected. So in very title is biased. They should never call it theory because one hand they are challenging serotonin hypothesis. On the other hand, they are using a complete paradoxical term which should not be ideally used here. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. That's actually very interesting because I didn't think of it from that perspective. Theory, theory is much more advanced than hypothesis. Yeah. Hypothesis, confirmation of hypothesis results in formation of theories. All right. Yes. Okay. So yeah. So that is the that is the case. And then and then the fact you know uh, I uh, actually let me bring some of the couple of last slides because those are interesting points. I let them go because of the time. Let me bring those back. We should. This is a very interesting topic, and I think we should not go over these, at least the last one. So the bone, uh, I'm sorry, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, for those people who don't know what is a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, it is, in my opinion, a common pathway for antidepressant response. Doesn't matter which type of, which class of antidepressant you're talking about, they are going to uh, end up in enhanced response or activity of BDNF. And SSRIs are the same. SSRIs, you know, there have been um, some evidence that they assessed BDNF levels in patients who responded to SSRIs versus those who did not respond to SSRIs. The patients who responded to SSRIs had elevated BDNF as a response of SSRI treatment. And the patients who did not respond did not have any increase in BDNF. So that tells you that serotonin hypothesis, and that is the reason I brought it here, because, because there's actually another evidence to support that serotonin does play some role in enhancing BDNF to mediate improvement in depression. You see what I mean? So that is the reason I brought this here. And um, one of the things which BDNF does is that it increases synaptic plasticity, which is not increased in number of neurons. It is actually the increase in connections between the neurons. Okay? So that's neuro, uh, plastic, uh, neuroplasticity. Um, but PDNF does increase neurons in one area of the brain, which is hippocampus. And that is also very important in resulting in an antidepressant response. So BDNF is important. Now, one of the interesting things which uh, I think is relevant here is that we were talking about 
developing newer treatment strategies with beyond monoamine hypothesis, right? Because serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine uh, is not the beginning or the end um, of it all. You know, there's so many different things which are happening, right? So you remember esketamine or ketamine, which have been approved in the treatment of uh, treatment refractory depression. Um, one of the fascinating thing is that SSRIs cause increase in BDNF in about four to six weeks. S-ketamine causes increase in BDNF almost immediately. That actually tells you that the reason why there's rapid onset of antidepressant effect with S-ketamine or ketamine is maybe perhaps also mediated by BDNF. So that is something to remember for you guys, okay? Okay, so that's BDNF. Let's go to the next one. So the, uh, you know, um, this is a point which is a little bit complex, but I wanted to tell you that there is a very meticulous process through which FDA approves psychotropic medications, including antidepressants, right? And the process is a little bit um, unrealistic. Why? Because they actually ask the pharma to do studies in patients who are ideal population. What does that mean? They don't have comorbidities. They don't have comorbid morbid, uh, psychiatric disorders or comorbid medical disorders. They don't have substance use disorders. They're medically stable, relatively speaking. And they actually fulfill the diagnostic criteria in most cases, only for that condition for which they are studying, studied, right? That's close to an ideal population. What do you think the general population is like that? Never. So that is why the efficacy trials done in the preclinical trial, which are required by the FDA, actually, are, those findings are not generally applicable to the general population. Why? Because you are studying an exclusive population, how can you, how can you um, project those uh, findings to the general population? It's against the, the the research models, right? But FDA does it because they really want to exclusively look at the impact of the treatment, not anything else. So they do have a point of view. I'm not I'm not criticizing them, but the end result is that you may get medications which may be effective in a subset of population, right? Potentially speaking. I'm not, it's not a confirmed statement, but I'm making a hypothesis here, okay? And that is one of the reason why these Me Too drugs, like fluoxetine, then sertraline, then citalopram, then peroxetine, and and then acetalopram and then fluoxamine, all these amines were studied in ideal population. And so it is not a direct link with this review, but that adds up to the problem. A study results, we talked about it. What do they tell us? That whatever antidepressants mechanism of action were used in, in a study did not comprehensively address the problem. So which means that serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine are not the only things. We need to improve our treatments. We need to involve other mechanisms as we are right now uh, making some progress. GABAergic systems are coming into play. Glutamate systems are coming into play. You know, trazi, uh, you know, those uh, trace amine associated uh, receptors uh, theory is coming, which is very fascinating. Opioid systems are coming into play in the treatment of depression. Cholinergic mechanisms are coming into play. So sky is the limit. So that actually, you know, requires us, me to be at least very, uh, uh, you know, be with humility. 
Uh, and a lot of times, you know, people think, Dr. Shahid, you are a psychopharmacologist. And uh, uh, do you think psychopharmacology is everything? No. You know, this is an important point I wanted to say is that, you know, one of the things which, which I have learned through life is that a reductionist approach to treatment of depression is not going to solve the problem. Psychopharmacology is only about 20% of the all treatments. It is maybe important in severe depression in, initially, but then if you don't improve patient's environment, patient's physical condition, patient's sleep is not adequate, patient's gut flora have dysbiosis, patient does not exercise, no physical activity, right? Patient eats, uh, eats uh, fast food, uh, uh, diet is not healthy, uh, and so forth. What are you going to do? Patient develops inflammation, which causes treatment resistance in so many different psychiatric disorders. Psychopharm is just part of a whole puzzle. And, and, and the issue is that when you start to criticize a certain theory, it is very detrimental to our patients because they start to lose further faith in treatments. And that is not good for our field. Even in the beginning, psychiatrists are doing horrible treatments out in the community. Very few people know psychopharmacology. They are actually, some of them are doing malpractice out there. They don't know ABC of psychopharmacology because training is not adequate these days in most places. So what are we doing? You know, something which is 20% reduced to 5% or not, maybe not even that because of lack of knowledge. What are you going to do? You know how difficult it is to get all those support systems which I just discussed, psychotherapy, counseling, healthy diet, poor people can afford it. I don't think so. People don't have food to eat. So I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent, but I very passionately think about these things. It is not that simple that you can stand up and challenge serotonin hypothesis and forget the whole picture. And then there are placebo effects, right? I'm sorry, OCD study uh, uh, story. I think we are out of time, right? Manu, you want me to continue for a couple of minutes? Or, uh, or let's finish it then. If uh, Dr. Ashraf or can tell us that, if we can continue, if it's okay. Uh, yes, I think, I, I think it'll be fine. Yeah, two, three minutes is fine. Okay. Uh, two minutes. Yeah. Okay. So basically the OCD, yeah. yeah, OCD, OCD story. The reason why I want to bring in OCD story is uh, obsessive compulsive disorder has one of the robust, most robust serotonergic support for its management. SSRIs, usually there are multiple types of OCD as well. But there is a there is a, there is there is a significant number of patients who actually respond so nicely to SSRIs, and relatively shorter time with really significant symptom improvement. Uh, that is one of the fastest psychiatric disorder responding to SSRIs. Similarly, premenstrual dysphoric disorder or late luteal phase, dys, uh, phase uh, dysphoric disorder really has been very effective. So serotonin is in effective control, emotion control. Nobody can deny the fact. You can reject hypothesis based on surrogate markers and checking blood levels and, and, and doing genetic studies. But the fact remains that serotonin will, is and will always remain one of the, one of the, not the only, one of the system which is highly uh, relevant uh, in uh, psychiatric disorders across eating disorders, anxiety disorders, everywhere. Placebo effect, huge problem. A lot of studies failed because of increased placebo response. Placebo response kills study. That is why we have to spend billions of dollars in developing drugs. But there's no answer. People have tried many strategies. Not been resolved yet. Industry influ influence. I don't have to elaborate on that. Industry influence comes to you. You have a chemical imbalance. You need to take 
drugs which enhance serotonin or norepinephrine or dopamine and you'll feel better. That is propagated, has been. Scientology is another problem. And at the last, look at who is writing the review. The person is already biased. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Dr. Shad, we have two more questions. If you can just quickly okay. answer them. Uh, what are the pharma uh, so what are the pharmacological effects of ECD? And is ECD helpful in OCD? Great questions. Uh, so uh, since, uh, you know, pharmacological is a kind of a, uh, a term which probably I will not use, but I would rather call it neurobiological effects, right? So ECT, you know, there are hundreds of papers on ECT um, and what could be the mechanism which actually makes a difference. Um, nobody's sure that what, what really ECT does um, uh, is, is actually responsible. I think there are multiple mechanisms which actually combine synergistically to, to give us the response which we see. One of the major uh, kind of conception I can give you about ECT is that it actually um, brings the brain in a position where you can start afresh, anew. It is stabilizes all the systems so that you can start restart from a baseline. It depolarizes the brain so that action potential changes after ECT can be uh, can take a fresh start and, and kind of a new start, a fresh start ECT, right? ECT um, um, has um, actually shown effects in all major regions of the brain which are supposed to be involved uh, with, with the depression, such as the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate, the subgenual cortex of anterior cingulate, uh, the posterior uh, 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 cingulate and the uh, pericuneus area, which are very important parts of the default mode network. So it actually is, is a very comprehensive kind of, kind of a reef uh, setting the brain down. Resetting the brain is the... And you know, the surprising thing since you're asking this is that ECT in some ways, um, you know, there is a mushroom which is getting very popular these days, psilocybin. Uh, so we just did a writer review, which is submitted for publication. And I looked at the, some of the major neurobiological, neuroimaging findings actually in functional imaging studies. And I was amazed that uh, some of the changes which occur with psilocybin are more consistent with ECT uh, than anything else. And for example, with psilocybin, um, uh, you know, uh, with SSRIs, what we have seen is that in the amygdala, which is a fear center of the brain, you actually uh, decrease blunt the response, amygdala response. And we believe that is decreases the fear and blunts the fear. And then that results in antidepressant effect, right? That was the theory. Now with psilocybin, everything is changed. Psilocybin actually stimulates amygdala initially. But there is this window which perhaps ECT also causes, where there is re uh, reconsolidation of memories. There's rebirth, there's a, a, a freshening, re uh, awakening or reawakening of, you know, kind of giving a chance to reset the brain and, and, and remodulate the, the thought process, right? So psilocybin is, is, is amazing. And the ECT reference actually reminded me of that. Uh, it's really, really fascinating okay, that, Psilocybin has a completely opposite effect as compared to SSRIs. Uh, and one or two dosages are effective for months. Actually, there is a recent study which actually showed psilocybin was effective in some patients for 12 months. I'll stop here. I can talk all day about this. And uh, sir, there's another question that, what are the effects? Uh, is ECT helpful in OCD? Oh yeah, OCD, I forgot. Sorry, I apologize. I forgot that question. Uh, yeah, so uh, so OCD, um, uh, as I told you, is of many types. There is OCD with insight. There is OCD without insight. There is OCD with, with, which is sometimes associated with Tourette's disorder, disorder the movement disorder, right? Um, and there is a type of OCD which is called intractable. It does not respond to anything. Respond to anything. In those, actually, 
the surg surgical remover, removal of part of the corded nucleus has been attempted, capsulotomy, right? And so there are types of OCD which are so severe that there are hardly any treatments. There is some evidence, uh, if I remember correctly, that ECT should be tried because there's nothing to lose there. And there's some reports that ECT can improve uh, OCD uh, symptoms which are not responding to anything before going to such a drastic measure of, <laughs> although, you know, capsulotomy is not done because deep brain stimulation uh, is also available, which actually has been found effective in the treatment of OCD has been approved in very treatment refractory cases, the deep brain stimulation, yeah. And we have one last question that just showed up right now, that what is the role of vortioxetine in depression? Yeah, vortioxetine is a uh, multimodal antidepressant. Uh, it is classified as such. It is one of the latest uh, uh, antidepressant. Um, it has multiple mechanisms of action. It actually uh, uh, has differential effect on 5-HT1A. Remember, we talked so much about 5-HT1A. Here it comes back again. Uh, so there are different types of 5-HT1A receptors. It's very complex. So there is 5-HT1D receptors, 5-HT1A receptors, 5-HT1B receptors. Uh, all are located at different sites in different parts of the uh, neuron, okay? So the somatodendritic receptors are 5-HT1D. And somato, uh, ex, I'm sorry, ex, exoexonal uh, 5-HT1 receptors are 5-HT1A. The moral of the story is that all these receptors are autoreceptors, which means when you stimulate them, they're going to reduce the outflow of serotonin from the presynaptic neuron, okay? So vertioxetine has um, uh, antagonist property at 5-HT1D, partial agonist property at 5-HT1A, and full agonist properties as 5-HT1B. Now, I don't have time to explain how does this translate, but all these combinations of these different effects on the 5-HT1 receptor actually creates a very beautiful kind of a controlled natural release of serotonin from the presynaptic neuron. And that is why vertioxetine has much more to offer. Not only that, vertioxetine also blocks the reuptake pump like SSRI at higher level, and it also blocks 5-HT7 receptors, which are thought to mediate its cognitive effects as well. So vertioxetine, the unique value of vertioxetine is that it is the only drug which is approved to improve attention and concentration in depressed patients by the FDA. This is the first time FDA has approved any SSRI for any cognitive function not global function, but just attention and concentration. So remember that because if there is an elderly patient who is struggling with cognitive symptoms, attention and concentration mainly, and also depressed, you should think about what you also did, okay? All right. Thank okay. you, Dr. Prasad. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you everyone for attending. Really uh, enjoyed this uh, great questions. Um, uh, and have a great day, rest of the day. Actually, you are at night, so have a good sleep. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.